Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on the rise of mal malvertising, analyzing the use of malicious digital ads in phishing campaigns. I am Daniel Pigeon. I'm product marketing at Cyberint. With me today is Or Sri Roar. He's a uh, threat intelligence team lead at Cyberint, and Johanna Tan Weasel. He is a senior threat intelligence analyst. So I will go ahead and share my screen, and we can get started. All right. Or and Yohana Tan, can you see? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Yeah, no. All right. Excellent. So I'll pass it off to you, or if you want to introduce yourself, and then Yohana Tan, you can introduce yourself as well. Okay. Uh, Yohana Tan, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jonathan, a cyber intelligence analyst working with Cyberint for over a year and a half now. I have uh, experience in anal research, was active in a special intelligence unit in the army, and uh, I was a certified uh, SOC analyst. And uh, passing on to you, Or. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is O. I'm a threat intelligence team lead. I'm working at Cybrain for more than two years now, and I'm based in Tel Aviv, Israel. OK. Um, Daniel, can you upload the deck, please? OK, perfect. So uh, to begin with, malvertising uh, is an abbreviation term of malicious advertising, and it refers to an evolving cyber attack technique of delivering malicious or harmful content through online advertisements. In malvertising campaigns, cyber criminals exploit the digital advertising ecosystem to spread malware, still sensitive information, or to execute other nefarious activities. These malicious ads can appear on legitimate websites, social media platforms, and other digital channel channels such as mobile applications and news websites. So um, this is a New York Times article from April 2018, approximately five years ago, which sheds light on a particular malvertising campaign that uh, targeted Amazon and remained quite widespread in the following years. During this campaign, users uh, visiting Amazon.com were greeted with a deceptive congratulations message, prompting them to participate in a quiz with promises of winning prices. Sadly enough, the victims who interacted with the quiz unknowingly became uh, susceptible to malware infections or granted the scammers access to their Facebook friends list. This article is uh, only one of many cases that were um, um, among the first to recognize the real threat of malvertising. Since then, the phenomenon of malvertising has evolved to a point where in November 2022, Microsoft disclosed that the Royal Ransomware Group used Google Ads to distribute malware. Of course, Microsoft will call out on Google's search engine since Google and Microsoft are competitors, right? However, um, we have also witnessed a significant malvertising campaign distributed through Bing Ads, uh, the search engines of, uh, of uh, Microsoft which, by the way, uh, is the case study that Yohanatel will be sharing with us today. Uh, moving forward, in late December, uh, the FBI Internet Cybercrime Center released a public service announcement warning people about brand, inf uh, brand impersonation and malicious search engine ads, um, as you can see here on the slide. Another major and fairly recent event that I would like to uh, mention here is that in late June, uh, beginning of July this year, threat actors associated with the notorious ransomware group Black Hat were observed utilizing malvertising techniques uh, to impersonate a well-known Windows file transfer application. I believe we can all understand the impact of such an attack, right? And so, when we're talking about malvertising attack vectors, 
Uh, we got here multiple examples of platforms that are being utilized by threat actors to leverage their attack. First, um, search engines like Google, Bing, Yahoo, etc. Um, scammers can easily manipulate their advertising systems to display malicious ads on the top of our search results, and by that leading us to access harmful websites. In addition to that, um, cyber criminals exploit social media platforms such as Facebook, Instagram, and so on. By injecting malicious ads or links, users, feeds, messages, or even sponsored posts. Later on today, we'll go through a couple of examples of this as well. And among other platforms, threat actors primarily target heavily visited websites such as news portal, e-commerce platforms, online forums, and others. All right, so let's go through some examples, shall we? When it comes to Google search engines, um, when we usually search for results, we're coming across uh, those sponsored results that you see on the slide uh, on the very top of the first page. Um, this is basically um, search optimization results, and I will pass it to Johanathan to explain it a bit. Yeah, so hello again. Uh... So first thing first, what is search engine optimization, or also known as SEO? It's just a term that means utilizing and optimizing the search engine's platform to distribute your website, your app, or your product. And of course, everyone is competing for the top. And there are various, uh, various ways to optimize it organically, such as link building, which generally just means having various links on other reputable platforms, also linking to your website, your product, such as LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and more, having an uh, SSL TLS certificate on your website, which is a must for today's standards, optimizing images, social media integration, user engagement, and much more. And you might think to yourself, this would require a lot of effort for a threat actor to, to target your website, to have all of this, because they would have to optimize their malicious infrastructure to be on the top uh, search results. So how do they deal with it, you may ask? Well, social media platforms and search engines uh, know this. They want to incentivize uh, advertisers and marketers to pay top dollar so that your website would reach the top of the search results and therefore helping you optimize your, uh, your search engine result, optimizing it to the top. So threat actors actually uh, caught on to this, that they can also do this. So this is the recent trend that we've seen. Threat actors are a lot more interested right now to purchase advertisement accounts uh, either stolen or have some various business logic bypasses and uh, to distribute their malicious infrastructure and bypassing all the requirements for organically optimizing their malicious infrastructure. I think we can uh, move on, or? Thanks, Jonathan. Okay, so when it comes to social media platforms, I think we're all familiar with the idea of going through our personal Facebook or Instagram feed and all of a sudden uh, get some sponsored ads, right? And here we have another example of a um, promoted sponsored ad on Reddit, um, innocently located between normal posts. Um, Daniel, can you go to the uh, next slide, please? All right. Um, another example can be found on news reading portals, uh, in this case, um, Dark Reading, a very known uh, cyber magazine and news website where we can find sponsored ads. Um, so we have here some ads of uh, Sumo Logic, Sysdig, um, et cetera. Um, in general, it is essential to understand the psychological circumstances under which we all, as human beings, uh, can fall into the malicious trap. Uh, primarily, most of us commonly assume that searching for Google results or scrolling through our Instagram feed is a safe activity. Um, second of all, 
when we see a sponsored ad uh, of one of our favorite clothing brands, we tend to think it's genuine uh, since it is a trusted brand. Uh, we also see from time to time the brick and mortar stores on the mall. Uh, our friends also put their uh, trust on these brands and so on and so forth. So it makes total sense. Um, last but not least, uh, we all come from different backgrounds and therefore we obtained um, throughout, uh, throughout the years different levels of security awareness. In general, we tend to rarely pause to investigate an ad and inspecting its URL before clicking on it. Okay. Um, let's talk a bit about the stages of carrying out such an attack on um, a search entrance. First, if I was a threat actor, I would first need to build a phishing website, which would include to register or uh, to hijack a domain. Then I would choose to add some sort of an aviation technique or to obfuscate the site. So um, let's say that I'm targeting Canadian victims, for example. So I can choose to apply a uh, geo-blocking mechanism on the web page, uh, so only victims from a Canadian affiliated IP address could access the malicious site, okay? Then uh, I would need to distribute uh, the campaign uh, through, let's say, Google Ads. And then last but not least, I would either deploy the malware or steal the personal data of the victims. Great. Um, when it comes to malvertising attacks on social media platforms, I would first need to create an impersonation account. I will probably abuse the logo and the trademark of the brand uh, that I'm impersonating to. Uh, I would purchase Facebook ads or Instagram ads, whatever I prefer the moment of initiating the attack. And then I can also pretty easily choose the target um, um, choose to target, sorry, uh, only certain uh, type of audience uh, by the geolocation or other parameters that I choose from. Uh, by the time that Facebook ad is, by the time that the Facebook ad is ready, uh, the victims will be redirected to the malicious website and we can deploy the malware or steal the personal data. Now we'll pass it to Johanathan to uh, show his very interesting uh, case study. Hello again, everyone. So this is actually a very interesting case where certain threat actors based in Russia were initiating a, suf a, sophist a sophisticated malvertising campaign targeting a large uh, banking slash finance client based in the US. Before the initial investigation, we discovered the newly registered lookalike domains. Sorry, there's a lot of, yeah, there was some background noise. Uh, so before the initial investigation, we discovered several newly registered lookalike domains, about eight uh, a total at first. Lookalike domains are just very similar uh, domains with uh, to the client with certain twists and typo squatting involved. And these usually don't have any phishing content or malware when they are detected. This, by the way, is a common tactic among threat actors. They usually park their infrastructure uh, with innocent content before deploying the campaign, and they wait for the right moment. Uh, in this slide, you can see uh, with our with our investigate in, in with our forensic canvas uh, when we map the infrastructure associated with the above campaign. Uh, so after we detected these lookalike domains, about two days after, uh, there was a suspicious advertisement really that was impersonating one of the client's brand. It had the exact same search engine result of their genuine website. And they had over, and this of course warranted an investigation. When we looked, we delved deeper into the IP address associated with the lookalike domains. And by the way, the advertisement redirected to one of the previously uh, located lookalike domains. And it turned out that this domain had over 250 active domains 
And all of these uh, domains, including the lookalikes, were directing to this malicious IP address. And I, it's also important to note that uh, lookalike domains, when they are firstly detected, while they have a twist or they, ha they are titles quieting your organization, for example, you cannot take it down right away until you have proof of phishing or uh, brand abuse content. So in our case, there was no malicious content at first, and two days later, the campaign went live. So this is a general overview of uh, the actions that the threat actor did. He took over, sorry, threat actors, probably. They took over 250 domains. And I mean it when I say they took them over. Over 250 domains with varying IP addresses and history going back from 2016 and before, they were taken over in a, in a span of about two weeks before the campaign. And then they registered the lookalike domains that we detected previously. After that, they rerouted all the domains to this one malicious IP. So they have a sort of like a command and control center for their phishing campaign. And this IP address hosted a phishing kit. A phishing kit is just a archive of all the necessary components needed to run a phishing website. So on this uh, IP address, they hosted the phishing kit, which had the the whole phishing infrastructure and then they could just load it to all these ip all these different uh, domains so they initiated uh, after after having the infrastructure ready they initiated the, the malicious advertisement campaign using a bing ads account and those that saw the ad url uh, and those that uh, that clicked on that URL were redirected to the phishing content. And also the threat actors implemented various evasion uh, tactics and to avoid detection and analysis. We can go to the next slide. So of course, what are the common evasion and obfuscation techniques that first hinder potential analysis or detection? The most, the most common one is geolocation filtering or also known as geoblocking, where you can uh, according to the user's geolocation, uh, block or, or allow certain traffic. So if I would target someone from Canada or someone from uh, France, I could uh, geoblock other IP addresses from other location. Um, in our example, we also had some redundant file directories. When you visit the website at first, you would see an innocent blog, nothing, nothing really out of the ordinary. And you have to find through a maze of uh, different files to discover the phishing website, which you are redirected to only if you meet the, the advertisement requirements, which is also one of the uh, techniques used here. As, as they had the Bing's ads account, they could target and personalize, personalize their ads to a certain demographic, a certain user base, they could pick uh, to target only your customers, for example, if they are targeting, let's say, I'll just throw out their uh, Google users, which is very broad, but it's just an example. They could uh, personalize their ad to only target known Google users. And of course, there are some other less, uh, less common tactics, which would also require some more effort on the threat actor side. And uh, it includes browser fingerprinting, which all of each one of us have their own unique fingerprint associated with their browser and their activity, which is also used by uh, advertisements, by the way. Uh, behavioral analysis, they could try to see just like cybersecurity experts, they could try to attempt to see if there's any uh, behavior not associated with a normal user. So they could try to hinder your analysis if you're trying to brute force uh, their directories or the, or the threat actors uh, infrastructure, they could also have that in place. And of course, user agent filtering, they could filter out certain crawlers or uh, or various other bots 
from accessing their website and also detecting the phishing content in the first place. That could also be used. So we can go over to the next slide. So this is just a general recap. What uh, victims, from their point of view, um, in, in a malvertising campaign. So first thing first, we have to ask, does the victim meet the threat actor's advertisement requirements? If they're not a customer of your organization that they're targeting, they're not into, interested in them uh, finding out the advertisement. This could also hinder uh, analysts, for example. Let's say you have a security analyst abroad from a different team located in a different country, he doesn't meet the, he or she, they don't meet the targeting requirement. So when it's, when it's required analysis, they wouldn't necessarily see the advertisement themselves. So only if the victim meets the threat actor's advertisement requirements, they would see the ad. And of course, if they click on the advertisement, they are redirected to the phishing site. Go over to the next slide. So what was the attack process from end to end? Uh, after meeting the advertisement requirements, the victim is redirected to a is redirected to a phishing website mimicking the client's brand. Of course, if they insert the username and password, in our case, uh, it sent a post request to a Telegram channel, which we were able to detect. Afterwards, they're redirected to a, a two-factor authenticated uh, phishing interface. And during that time, the threat actors initiate a login request on the, uh, on the genuine, on the client's website in attempt to, uh, this is an attempt to get their, to be able to fish their 2FA code. Then the victims get a genuine 2FA code of a login request to their uh, mobile phone or email. And in case they put it in the 2FA phishing interface, the threat actors are able to harvest this and then take over the account. And, and in our case, after the supposed victim would enter the 2FA code, they would be redirected to the real website. And then they would think, oh, something happened. I'll put my contact again and without them, without knowing that their account was potentially taken over. We can go over the next slide. This, by the way, I wanted to show an example of uh, someone. This, by the way, is a threat actor that I've engaged in the past. He's very talented, let's say, in that regard, uh, targeting various entities with uh, sophisticated phishing kits. And also, uh, fairly recently, July 6th, as you can see, the date, has a uh, promotion selling Google ad accounts uh, with a reduced price of 80 US dollars until the 26th of, uh, this was on July 6th, it probably has a typo, but it was until 26th of July. In our, uh, and this Google account that is, that is for sale, it could be either stolen Google ad accounts via malicious malware, or this could also be Google ads that the threat actor created himself and has various scripts put in place, able to uh, bypass the, the guardrails that are put in place by Google to detect malicious behavior. That could also be the case. You can go over the, some other examples, or I think uh, you can take over the Facebook ads Okay, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Daniel, can you go uh, please to the uh, social media uh, examples? Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, I would like us to go through very nice examples of uh, brands that uh, we probably all familiar with. Uh, a couple of days ago, uh, we came across these Facebook ads impersonating some of the most popular sneaker brands. Uh, Daniel, can you uh, pass the next slide, please? So, as you can see here, um, we were able to catch those, uh, these two Facebook ads offering New Balance and ASIC sneakers at extremely low prices. Um, 
when these ads are being sponsored at a large scale on Facebook, um, innocent Facebook users might also uh, mistakenly unwillingly click on, on the malicious links that they, uh, that they offer and be redirected to the phishing website. Um, as you see here on the screenshot, um, the sneakers are being offered for very, very low prices, uh, around 20 bucks, um, which might lead to, uh, to uh, a lot of uh, uh, victims here that would click on this link and be redirected to the phishing websites. Um, Daniel, can you uh, pass to the next slide, please? All right. We also gathered some uh, screenshots for you. Um, the website that the victims are being redirected to is uh, a type of squatting uh, domain, meaning uh, instead of newbalance.com, uh, it's spelled differently, uh, double V instead of double uh, U in this case. And um, by the way, this, uh, this phishing website is still up and running. Uh, we checked it uh, just before uh, beginning the webinar today. Um, so as we speak, this uh, campaign targets more and more victims. Um, another uh, very nice example that we have here is the um, ASICS uh, sneakers phishing website, uh, which uh, in this case, uh, the lookalike domain uh, has less similarity to the ASICS main domain, the official domain, but uh, we're also able to see that it had uh, a different TLD um, in the end of the domain. Instead of uh, .com or .us, uh, it had uh, .shop, uh, which is uh, fairly suspicious uh, TLD for uh, normal websites, I would say. All right. And so I'll pass it to Yehonatan uh, to talk about the uh, recommendations on how to mitigate these threats and the challenges on mitigating uh the email advertising campaigns yeah so hello everyone again uh, regarding uh, the previous advertising campaign there were certain challenges that were associated with the takedown procedure in the end don't worry we were able to take down the infrastructure successfully we have our remediation experts to thank for that so regarding the evasion techniques that were used by the threat actors here it's not only hinders potential analysis of or detection for, uh, for analysts, it also hinders analysis for the investigators on the other side associated with the hosted platform. So in case, so at first, the challenge we had when we tried to, let's say, take down the, the domain, when we send it over, and by the way, when you visit, when you visited the domain, you wouldn't be uh, redirected to the phishing content. It's only if you clicked on the phishing ad. So if I would share them the and the ad is personalized, if I would share with them the advertisement URL and they are, and let's say the advertisement targets US customers and the hosting provider uh, that is helping me regarding the takedown request is in France, from his point of view, he would visit my fish, my ad URL, see that the website has no phishing content, and says and uh, tell me, hey, I don't see any phishing content. I I have to deny your takedown request. There is no proof. So this, so in our example, what we did is we were able to brute force the file directories and show them uh, the the whole infrastructure. Show them this is the proof that this was phishing content. And of course, we also have some uncooperative registrars and hosts, especially if they are based in, in other nation states that are less cooperative. So uh, registrars and hosts have their various policies put in place, which they can deny or agree with your takedown request. And of course, geopolitical challenges. If, if the infrastructure is based in, uh, let's say, a, a state that is aggressive towards Western society, we can all think of uh, uh, several, I believe, they have a lot more lax international laws and they wouldn't, and they wouldn't uh, we don't have legal jurisdiction on their soil. 
we have to be creative in that regard sometimes to be able to take down this kind of campaign. And of course, the, uh, last but not least, we have persistence. If you remember from the previous campaign, we had over 400, uh, sorry, we had, I was in the end, but we had at first 250 uh, domains that were ready and only about a couple of, uh, of active domains were actively participate, participating with the advertisement campaign. So if I would have taken down only a part of the infrastructure, the threat actor had hundreds of domains ready to fill in the void. So this is also why it's important to take out the root. We can move over to the other slide, which is focusing on the remediation steps. So one of the way to mitigate the risk uh, and the rise of malvertising is to monitor for local -like domains. In our example, we were able to detect the infrastructure uh, before it was active, which let us prepare in advance. So in our case, uh, so in our case, when we monitor for the local -like domains, we already know, uh, we already saw a bunch of eight local -like domains associated with one IP address mimicking our targeted brand. We already know that this is probably going to be suspicious and we can look, look out for it. And when malicious content is detected, uh, thanks to monitoring, we are able to deal with it promptly. And the second one, of course, security awareness training. We as human beings are always going to be the uh, weakest link in cybersecurity. And uh, it's important to, it's important especially for employees to be aware of the ad, that advertisements can also be abused for malicious purposes. So it's important to look at the ad URL before you click on it. So if I look for example, Microsoft Word, and I see a, a template, let's say I'm looking for a template, uh, and I see uh, the, the title that it's sponsored on the top left, I should verify if it does indeed redirect me to a safe template on a legitimate domain and not redirect me elsewhere. And also, you might be surprised that we can also have our own ad campaign that will outperform the malicious campaign. This, of course, is not uh, necessary to have at all times, but in case you're already targeted by malicious ads, where the thing is your organization already has uh, or organically optimized your website. You have you probably have social media following, you have links on various platforms, uh, search engines and social media already give it a higher reputable scores uh, uh, compared to the malicious infrastructure. So in case, uh, you have an advertisement being run, your advertisement will most likely be placed first and not second, for example. And the malicious infrastructure, if it's only the malicious in infrastructure competing with your brand, then of course you'll only have two sponsored ads, but uh, people are a lot more likely to click the first, uh, the first page result rather than the second. So this also reduces the potential risk, especially it targets your customers. And of course, most important is to report the malicious content itself that is distributing the, the phishing, the malicious advertisement. It's not enough to only take down the infrastructure behind it, but we can also take down the advertisement account. We can report it for abuse and show them the proof, hey, this phishing, this advert malvertising, uh, this advertisement redirects me to a phishing page. Please take down this account. And then the threat actor can't reuse their ad campaign uh, on other domains. So instead of like uh, a whack-a-mole trying to take down uh, only the infrastructure, you can also take down the ad account distributing their malicious content. Okay, so I'll jump back in here for just one moment to say a little bit about what we do at CyberInt. Uh, as you've heard today, we do uh, social media monitoring and phishing detection, but we actually do quite a bit more 
um, at CyberInt. So we began as a uh, managed services and investigation, threat investigation uh, organization and built our own tools. Eventually those tools became so sophisticated that they were worthy of uh, becoming their own product and platform to sell to customers. So threat intelligence uh, was the first major use case that we covered. So that's monitoring the deep and dark web for things like data leaks, exposed credentials, malware infections. Uh, but we also do digital risk protection, which is covering all forms of brand impersonation and brand abuse, whether that's on a phishing site, um, social media impersonation, or VIP impersonation and attacks of that nature. Additionally, we do attack surface management. So that's continuously discovering and monitoring uh, external IT assets for things like misconfigurations, high risk CVEs, uh, or potential exposures of cloud storage buckets and uh, risks of that nature. And most recently we have uh, released our supply chain intelligence module, which helps to monitor risks with third party suppliers and vendors, including uh, using deep and dark web intelligence to understand when one of your suppliers is under attack or experiencing some kind of data breach. So if you're interested in learning more, please reach out to us and we would be very happy to uh, show you the platform in greater detail. And with that, we're gonna jump to the Q and A. We actually have a few questions that came in uh, from, from viewers. So I'll go ahead and get started with the question from David. Are there examples of AI usage for malware? Hey, or do you want me to answer that? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so um, AI usage of malware. So basically, uh, in the past few months, since the the, the spike and you know the, the whole chatter about uh, ChatGPT and AI uh, uh, engines uh, going uh, really fast, um, yes, there are many many uh, examples of uh, how threat actors. Uh, manipulate those engines and utilize them to um, not only leverage attacks, but also to assist and preparing more and more attacks than the usual. Meaning if I'm a threat actor and it takes me, I don't know, one hour to initiate uh, a, a normal attack, I might use uh, um, some AI tools to um, leverage the same amount of time uh, dozens of attack and and to multiple the um, the targeted victims uh, um, number and also multiple the the um, number of attacks that I'm initiating. Uh, so this is first and second. I believe uh, um, threat actors, not all of them, uh, of course. Uh, Another point that we should uh, mention here is that not all threat actors are um, kind of you know. Um, uh, zero day genius uh, uh, specialists. Uh, most of them are taking uh, some uh, known phishing kits and uh, replicate them and use them in order to um, uh, try to create uh, similar uh, phishing websites or similar uh, uh, scams. Okay. And um, many times they are uh, encountering uh, some challenges and some uh, um, phases that they cannot really uh, fully understand how to, how, to, uh, um, um, how to resolve. And many times they can uh, utilize those AI uh, engines in order to, to better uh, uh, resolve uh, their, their problems uh, as fast as they can. So these are, I think, the two main uh, um, examples of how threat actors are using AI uh, in order to uh, um, assist them in, 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 uh, in attacks, but I'm sure there are many, many others as well. I would also like to add that I personally have uh, seen various tutorials and uh, various methods that are shared by threat actors, reputable ones, that are known for uh, giving you or drill down how to create an effective phishing campaign or how to uh, target uh, an organization with smishing, for example, which is phishing via an SMS message. So in, in what's, what's actually pretty interesting in these examples is that threat actors have already started to share that, hey, now it's easier than ever. We can create 
a, a, re, a real looking genuine template of a of a, of a message of a message that is impersonating an employee or high ranking individual from the organization uh, with various human behaviors put in place in the template such as empathy and various social engineering techniques threat actors are already implementing AI tools for uh, various attacks all right thanks guys uh, one more question from Darwin I've experienced similar malvertising ads on social media sites and reported it to the authentic brands websites is there any way where the social media sites can automatically filter or block such malvertising? Uh, I think that uh, the reputable search engines such as Bing, Google, and uh, Yahoo, they are aware of the risk. They, uh, they are aware of the dangers and they are always trying to uh, mitigate it. But still, it's not enough, as of course, threat actors are resourceful. They will always try to bypass the logic behind the guardrails that they have put in place. And they are uh, very nifty. And of course, uh, these ad accounts, they also require some uh, reputation. So they do have algorithms put in place that can detect such such suspicious behavior and potential malicious in, malicious infrastructure. But threat actors don't use new accounts for this. They usually have accounts that are able to bypass, uh, to bypass it, uh, the logic bypass put in place. They are also able, um, well, not only to bypass, they can also buy outright accounts that already have some reputation. They could, uh, they could buy it from various stealer malwares that harvest credentials that are saved on your personal machine. And in case one of the machines have their own advertisement account, threat actors could attempt to use that as well. So it's not only new accounts or uh, newly created accounts that are able to bypass the logic, they can always use uh, stolen accounts as well just have a malvertising campaign put in place, uh, burn that account, and then buy another account in the future. So as, you sh as I showed beforehand, someone was offering a Google Ads account for $80. But we've usually seen these kinds of accounts for sale in the hundreds or even thousands of dollars. It really depends on the reputation it has. If it's a, an old account that has um, running has been running ads for several years years it will be a lot more uh, reputable and will cost more among uh, threat actors so i think uh, yeah that answers the question social media right. sites they do have uh, they can ultimately filter and block such malvertising but uh, threat actors they are always nifty in their ways, and it's like a whack-a-mole uh, trying to run after them. And also, uh, like ju just like you said, Darwin, it's important to report it to the brand and also to report it to the platform that is abused. All right, thank you, Yonatan. So I think that we are just about out of time. Um, I would like to say thank you to Oren Yohanatan, but to both of you guys for a fascinating presentation. Um, I really learned a lot and I'm sure that everyone who joined us did as well. So thank you and thank you to everyone who took time out of your day to, uh, to join this presentation. Hope you found it useful. And as I said earlier, please feel free to reach out uh, if you have any questions um, about what we do at CyberAnd and would like to, to have a uh, personalized demo of the platform. So thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful uh, rest of your day or evening, depending on where you are. And thank you very much. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank Daniel. you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.